excited yet? Are you allowing yourself to get excited? Do you have a, a guard up? Are you worried about, like, I don't know, the bob-nutting Kool-Aid infecting your veins or something? Good morning to you. Good Monday morning from Miami. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports, and this is Daily Shot of 4 and O Pirates. Comes your way bright and early every weekday if you're into football and or hockey. I also offer daily shots of Steelers and Penguins in the same place that you found this. Pirates 9, Marlins 7 in 10 innings. Pirates take all four games of an opening series on the road for the first time since, oh, 1903, the year of their first World Series championship, the year that Pittsburgh invented the World Series. Look that one up sometime. Bailey Falter got smacked around the way he always does. Five runs before there was even an out. But the Pirates overcame that. The Pirates battled back, capped by Rowdy Telez, blasting, really, a three-run homer in the seventh inning by a run. David Bednar couldn't hold that lead in the ninth. The Pirates came back in the tenth inning, and putting up two runs without the ball ever once leaving the infield. Lots of little well-executed detail, in particular the Jason DeLay safety squeeze with pinch runner O'Neal Cruz alertly jumping, and I mean jumping, off a of third base with what had wind up being the winning run. Hunter Stratton with the save. That's the kind of four games, really, the whole week how all of that went. There were so many players involved in this that one of the contributors, Jose Hernandez, was sent down because Rowanzi Contreras returned from paternity leave. So it's, it's I don't know, I, I guess the first thing that I have to say here is you're free to feel what you want to feel. That's true of any of us in any setting. If you want to trust your eyes, if you want to trust the stats, if you want to trust some of the more anecdotal slices of information that people like me will provide from the road, go ahead. Put it all into whatever it is that you want. The only thing that I'll say, and this is speaking for nobody other than myself, is that this is different than last year. The clubhouse is different. It's got a very different vibe to it. It's got a different reaction to the early winning. They're not gosh wow over this. They're looking around at each other in the room and saying, okay, that guy over there, pointing to our oldest Chapman, hypothetically, he's been throwing 100 plus his whole life. He went out there in the eighth inning of this game and threw 100 plus and mowed some people down. Telez hit 35 homers for Milwaukee a couple of years ago. He's a big boy with a big swing. When he runs into one, that's where it's going to go. Jared Jones, my goodness. I mean, I don't even know what to say about what I witnessed here with that young man on Saturday. I'm not trying to hype this up. I feel like I've been as skeptical as anyone of a lot of different things, not least of which was management's will to win, which is a heck of a thing to be skeptical about. I didn't like certain elements of the roster. I definitely didn't like certain elements of the rotation. And some of that's borne itself out. These haven't been four perfect games for the Pirates. They just haven't. But I got to tell you, and again, speaking just for myself here, that I kind of like that part too. I, I like when comparing to the stuff from last April when the team started off 20 and 8 and everybody was all super stoked about it. If you'll recall, everything went right for that team. They were top five in hitting, pitching, and defense at that point of the season, meaning 20 and 8. They were top five in home runs, which was crazy. Why was it crazy? Well, because the individual performances were, for the most part, people living way over their heads. They were due for a comeuppance. They were due for a vicious comeuppance. And of course, by the time May rolled around, they got it, especially the offense. So I'll throw this back at you. 
just asking you, when you've watched this team through four games, name for me an individual who's performing over his head, over what you see as a realistic, sustainable thing. And and don't get into batting averages through four games, because those are always going to be skewed to look a little weird. Like when you see Kebrian Hayes, who was not this player a year ago, he didn't become this player until after the All-Star break last summer. When you see him hitting the way he is now, do you think to yourself, man, that's really just outlandish? No, of course you don't. When you see Brian Reynolds hitting like this, you don't think that. Here's an example that might fit this discussion better. What about Connor Joe? Connor Joe's off to a really nice start. Why? Well, the, the, the truth is Joe's always been very good against lefties. And all he saw down here was lefties. So high marks to Derek Shelton there for getting him into the leadoff spot for all four games and taking advantage of that. Is that over his head? No, not really. Not when you look at his career splits. Anybody else out of whack? Anybody? I don't think so. Not in the lineup. Not in the rotation, because for the most part, the rotation hasn't really been great. Mitch Keller wasn't great. Martin Perez was decent, but again, not great. Okay, well, Jones was great. So I didn't mean to lump him in with that assessment. Jones was great. But is he doing something that he's not capable of doing? Uh, Nobody seems to think that. And then there's the bullpen, which has been out of this world, but only after everyone had projected that this bullpen should be out of this world. 21 plus innings, two runs. And what's more, they showed in this very, very short sample that they can win different ways. They can do different things. They look like a more mature team. And I'll bring up again that they took the lead with a monster home run, but then they won the game with just a whole bunch of National League looking small ball. I asked Shelton afterward. Well, here, just listen to it. Are you more into three-run homers or not having the ball leave the infield I'm, as a yeah. manager? Which one? I, I like three-run homers. I was a hitting coach, so three-run homers are good. <laughs> okay, but the hitting coach is responsible for bunts, too. Yeah, I mean, we did a good job. I mean, Alika got a bunt down, you know, in a situation where you normally don't bunt, but, mm-hmm. you know, not too many teams are able to deploy a weapon like we were able to with O'Neill being there, and we wanted to get him to third, and then J.D. did a good job getting one down, so we did back-to-back jobs, and then Michael Taylor, I mean, off the bench with two really big at-bats. Yeah, he was smiling and he was laughing. And I obviously wasn't being serious when I asked that. But there was a lot of that in the clubhouse. And these guys feel good about themselves, but not because of the results. That's the difference. Last year, they felt good because they were getting results and they would actually see, hear, and read the team name in various media and feel like, hey, wow, look at us. We're actually a part of Major League Baseball. We're just one of the 30 teams. That's really neat. That's not this. That's not what we're watching. And believe you me, that's not what I'm hearing in that room. Mitch Keller asked me as I was preparing to leave the clubhouse what everybody was talking about back home. Are they excited? He wanted to know. And I was about to answer him, at least to the best of my ability, And he went and answered it himself before I had a chance. He said, they should be. We're a good team. Okay, good team. Seems like a fair assessment, reasonable assessment. When we come back, J1Q. This portion of Daily Shot of Pirates is brought to you by our friends at North Shore Tavern. That's directly across Federal Street from PNC Park. It's home of Steak on a Stone. An eating experience, underscoring the word experience. The steak is brought to you partially cooked on an 800 degree stone and you do the rest. It's a ton of fun, it's a great meal, and it's a baseball atmosphere like no other in Pittsburgh. North Shore Tavern, right across Federal Street from PNC Park. Today's J1Q comes from Scott. It's a good one. He says, DK, what's the biggest surprise for you 
after this opening sweep. For me, it's the offensive production from Michael A. Taylor, something I was not expecting to see after everything I'd learned about him. Well, I mean, he was good offensively. He made occasional contact. He made the most of it. I don't know that anybody should be raising the bar for him as far as you know where he'll end up at the end of the season. He's been around for a while now. Uh, he's not going to be somebody who's surprising anybody over any sustained stretch. I'm not saying that in any way, shape, or form to be critical. I thought he had a very nice series. More than anything, being honest with you here, I, and I said this when he was acquired, I just like having him out there, meaning out there in center field. I liked seeing him come onto the field as a defensive replacement. Derek Shelton brought this up after the game, by the way, on his own. That Taylor ended up having two really good at bats off the bench. And this isn't a guy who spent a lot of time in his career coming off the bench. And he had good at bats that led into his own moments at the plate. My guy, since you asked, my biggest surprise, and I'm putting this one forth here on this program today as if this were a confessional. It's Ryan Barucki. Now, I know he's not new. He shouldn't be surprising anybody, let alone somebody who's around the team all the time. But I feel like a couple of things. One, I spent probably more time with him, talking to him on this trip, than I had in the entire rest of his tenure in Pittsburgh. Not sure why. Sometimes that just happens. There's 26 players on the active roster. You can't talk to all of them all the time. It just worked out over these past five days that I got to know him. In turn, and this is kind of human nature, when he came on, I I was more locked in on his performance, on his pitch arsenal, uh, on his precision with those pitches, and on top of all that, his poise on the mound. This is a really nice asset for this bullpen to have, and For those of you who are listening to this going, no kidding, genius. Okay, look, I knew he had a good 2023. I'm just laying it bare here for you, all right? So you can trust me in other situations where I say, hey, I really know this guy. And whatever. Okay, well, I'm giving you the opposite here. So, for example, when he struck out the first two batters that he faced in the seventh inning, one was a lefty, one was a righty. And both of those pitches showed up on StatCast as sliders, because they kind of had slider action, but they had very different results that they got from both of these hitters, the first of whom was Luis Arias, the defending National League batting champion, and the second was our old friend Josh Bell, only swung around to the right side facing the lefty. These pitches ate them up. So in something that I might not have done last year because I didn't really feel like I knew the guy all that well. This time I went to Baraki after the game and said, these pitches look really, really sharp and they had big effects on the batter. They, they almost had different effects. And he said, that's because <laughs> neither of them was a slider. And another pitcher sitting next to him kind of laughing because they, they get this all the time. StatCast puts out these really definitive pronouncements on what the pitches are, and we all assume that they're they're accurate, and they're not. A lot of times, only the pitcher and the catcher know what that pitch was. In this case, as Baraki told me himself, the first was a sweeper and the next one was a cutter. One is intended to do something to a lefty, one is intended to do something to a righty, and they both met their goals and then some. So there, I hope that offers a a fair answer to you of what would have surprised me. That's the kind of thing that'll surprise me as a reporter, as opposed to performance. I want to learn more about the individuals. I want to learn more about what they're trying to do. I've been doing a lot of that, actually, with Luis Ortiz. His English isn't the best, but I, I prefer to try at least talking to these guys without the interpreter just to see what I can get from them without putting them on the spot. And I can tell you guys that Ortiz is growing up right in front of our eyes, and that's been really fun to see. Another name I'm going to throw in there, even though he got sent back to Indianapolis yesterday, is Jose Hernandez. 
Saw a lot of things that I liked from him on and off the field in this series. All right, you got three answers now for the price of one. Let's do this again tomorrow, everybody. Thanks so much for listening to Daily Shot of Pirates.